This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. This chapter deals with internal controls in related matters. It's important to realise who is responsible for internal controls, and corporate governance says that internal controls must be developed by an organisation, and these must be clearly understood by staff. Internal controls are the mechanisms really by which the transactions of an organization can be controlled, the assets can be safeguarded, and that we can rely on information being produced and relate to management. Internal controls, the system, if you like, the model, falls into two parts. First of all, there's what's called the control environment. And you can think of the control environment as really being the culture of the organization. Is it an organization where uh, controls are valued, where the managing director, the CEO, and so on, they really want things to be done properly, they want the information to be filed correctly, they want reconciliations to be done, they want authorizations to be performed. Are they kind of fairly strict and, and, and actually think that controls are useful? Or are they much more lax? Do they see that controls are uh, <clears throat> probably a waste of time, probably get in the way of carrying out transactions promptly? If it's a former, if, if uh, management takes the whole business internal controls very seriously, believes it is valuable, then the internal control system is likely to be fairly good. If the control environment is unfavourable, management does not treasure and appreciate controls, then even though the controls might be there in theory, they're likely to fall into disuse because frankly, no one's actually very interested in them. Then there are the detailed controlled processes. For example, as we've mentioned before, if you uh, do some overtime, a suitable control uh, is that your manager uh, signs off some sort of timesheet uh, as evidence that you didn't do indeed do this overtime. If a new customer comes along and wants, let's say, $20,000 credit, then a suitable control will be to take out some sort of credit reference, uh, to look at their financial statements to see if 20000 credit seems to be a reasonable figure in the context of that company. And then you would say, uh, have to follow up uh, the invoices, making, making sure they are paid promptly. Otherwise, if there's an absence of internal control over new customers, you could be sending out goods to people who will never, ever pay you. Similarly, you need to safeguard assets, particularly cash, uh, particularly uh, high-value portable inventory, like in a, in a jewellery store or perhaps an electronics uh, company. Uh, it, it may also be uh, necessary to safeguard non-current assets like laptops and so on. If these are not uh, safeguarded, uh, then they're likely to go missing or be stolen. You need uh, also controls over the disbursement of cash, making payments. If you didn't have a, an adequate control, how do you know you haven't paid a supplier twice? And you may occasionally yourself have almost become slightly confused. You know, have I paid the electricity bill or not? Uh, if you don't mark it off, there's not a system of marking it off or filing it or tearing it up and throwing it away even. You can get uh, a, a bit confused on your own life, think what it's going to be in a company with maybe thousands of transactions a day, uh, working out what's been paid, what cash has been received, what inventory there is, and so on. So the sort of control processes, there is authorization, there's physical control, there's performance reconciliations. So a bank reconciliation is giving you some evidence that the uh, cash book amount is, is correct, and so on. Uh, there is the idea of control totals. Uh, so the receivables ledger, there's normally a control account and, and so on. Uh, you can have sequential uh, checks uh, so that every invoice you issue is sequentially pre-numbered. And if sequentially pre-numbered, you keep copies of these. Then you can quickly, by going through the sequence, identify maybe one of these has gone missing and never been sent out or, or something else has gone wrong. So uh, there are a number of really pretty straightforward common sense 
control processes that can be adopted. Remember, it is the responsibility of the directors to establish an internal control system, to keep it under review, and to use information provided by the accounting system for the management of the company. External auditors are not responsible for setting up an internal control system. They will carry out their audit procedures. If they happen to find that an internal control procedure is not being followed or is absent, they will write to the directors as a service, but it is not the external auditors who are responsible for ensuring the internal control is correct. Internal auditors spend much more time looking at the uh, design and the uh, execution, really, the internal control systems, they're likely to get into much more detail. Computer systems uh, forms a kind of a <coughs> specialist area of internal controls. And you have in computer systems two categories of control. You have got general controls and you have got application controls. Think of general controls as controls really over almost the environment in which the, the IT system sits. Uh, you want to make sure that access to the system is password controlled. You want to make sure there are virus checkers. You want to make sure there are firewalls to stop hacking. You want to make sure that there are backups. You want to make sure that if a program is amended, that it is thoroughly tested before it goes live, if you like, uh, because once customers begin using this program and it's not operating correctly, uh, chaos can result in that. There should be physical controls over, you know, lock away the, the, the important files, the, the server, if you like, of the network, uh, to ensure that it physically can't be damaged or, 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 or elements from it can't be, be copied by you know, plugging in a, a USB stick and the like. So these general controls uh, uh, really uh, are there over all of the, the IT system. And then you have what are called application controls. How are we going to control what happens, say, in a wages and salary system? How are we going to control what happens in uh, the sales system and the purchasing system? These are all applications. Uh, th these are the parts of the IT systems which actually you know, accomplish a specific bit of programming. And we need to make sure that uh, the initiation of transactions is OK, that it is recorded correctly, that it is processed correctly, uh, and also, if there are any confidential reports being produced, like people's wages and salary slips, that the distribution of any output is also controlled. So we're talking here about input controls, processing controls, controls over standing data. Standing data is occasionally called reference data. Uh, reference data is data which doesn't change very often. So your salary is reference data or standing data. So every month, really, the salaries program uses the same piece of information from your salaries file, your salary, to work out your salary. If that goes wrong, if uh, some uh, uh, error is present in, in your annual salary figure, then every time salaries or wages are produced, uh, they will be wrong. Similarly, uh, if the price of a product is in there incorrectly, every time someone buys that product, uh, another error is, is kind of perpetrated. And you, you've probably heard on the press, you know, where an airline says you can fly from uh, London to New York or something for like $2 return. Uh, that, that is a, an error in the standing data. Uh, and, and potentially people are then crowding in there trying to buy this very cut price uh, uh, ticket. Usually the airline manages to get out of it, saying the, that the mistake was obvious uh, within that. The problem with standing data is because it doesn't change very often, uh, uh, people maybe don't check up on it very often. Uh, we need almost a deliberate policy of going through all the salaries, going through all the selling prices on at least an annual basis to make sure they're still at what they should be. Controls over output, we've, we've talked about. Uh, some output is confidential and needs to be carefully handled. 
So what are the, the sort of application controls that uh, can specifically be used in an IT system? And we have batch controls. So a batch control would be as follows. Let's say you've got three invoices you want to process, uh, one of 20, one of 30, and let's say one of 40. And of course, there's a, you know, invoices, there's a huge volume of them, but potentially there's a, a chance that the, the input is mistyped. That's how it's going to be done here. So what you do first is you go through the list of an pending input and you add it up. And this is your batch total. So when this information is being processed, the first thing you do is you input the batch total, 90. Uh, and then what the computer does is it adds up all the subsequent input and it reconciles them. So if you had, uh, instead of typing in 40 here, you had typed in 50, then obviously it's not going to add up. Uh, and the batch would be uh, rejected as there being some sort of uh, problem within it. Sequence checks. Uh, uh, sequence checks, uh, for example, uh, every paper check, bank check that's written out has a sequence number, a unique sequence number on it. Uh, and if it's been processed to the cash book, you can keep track of how we got all of these checks accounted for, and it can stop you putting in the same payment twice, and so on. A range test. Uh, for example, uh, if uh, we are putting in days of the week, uh, they should never be other than one to seven. And again, if somebody types in you know, 10, it's obviously wrong. That's, that's known as a kind of an edit check. You're trying to look at the, the, the correctness of the data by some sort of little test on it. A dependency check. Uh, we know that if you're doing days of the month, you can get up to 31. But if you say 31.2, 2019, that's obviously wrong. Because this bit of data here depends on that bit of data. Nothing wrong with either of them on their own, but it's a relationship that you expect to be uh, uh, held. Check digits, we won't get into that uh, too much, but basically uh, uh, what it is, uh, is that you construct account numbers, employee numbers, part numbers, in some special way uh, so that they comply to some sort of uh, arithmetic. So uh, it could be, uh, <clears throat> for example, if you had an account number, and this is a very simple example of a, uh, of a, of a check digit, uh, the account number is, let's say, 122. Two. The way you could construct a, a kind of check digit is to say, well, actually, we want the sum of these numbers in the accounts to be divisible by three precisely. So one, two, two isn't, that's two plus two plus one, that's five, that's not gonna work. So the check digit on the end would be a one. So now it adds up to six, it is evenly divisible by three, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it cuts down the chance that somebody will type in a number that is directly divisible by three, by, kind of by accident. Now, that's a very, very simple, trivial example of it. The, the, the arithmetic rules that these numbers have to comply with are much more complex, uh, so that it's a very small chance that by accident you happen to type in a number that was wrong, but which nevertheless complied with the arithmetic check. Exception reports. So, uh, for example, you normally expect your people to be working at 40 hours a week. Uh, you might have a range test in that, that you would never allow anyone to put in more than 70 hours a week as being completely outside this uh, feasibility. But what you might do is to say, well, if somebody is over 60 hours a week, it's maybe worth a look. It's not wrong, it's not rejected, but it's rather exceptionally high, uh, and maybe we ought to you know, spit that out so the manager can have another little look at it to, to make sure that the figure is, is correct. We should check amendments to standing data. Very difficult to do that other than to, to eyeball it, really. 
So if someone were to get married and change their name, the only way you could make sure that the name has really been correctly altered is to say, well, it's supposed to be saying, uh, it's changed, you know, from, let's say, Miss Smith to, to Mrs. Jones. The only way you can really do it is to, is to look at the new name and say, yes, it is indeed Mrs. Jones and it is spelt correctly. Passwords, uh, you all know about passwords. Uh, it's important, of course, that they're kept uh, secure, that maybe they're changed frequently and so on. You don't want passwords to be kept in a post-it note in the, the top drawer of the desk or even worse on the monitor of the machine. And access controls, this often works with a password's access to the system, but it also means physical access controls. Uh, quite often people have got like key cards, like for hotel room uh, locks to get into particular areas of, of the business uh, in very secure uh, uh, locations. You can only access the system through a specific computer. So it means you're always in a public area, people can see what's, what's happening. You can't go off to some kind of quiet private area, access the computer and be kind of up to no good uh, within that. Now, what we need to look at is, is one possibility of lax internal control is fraud. So poor internal control can give rise either to errors, which is innocent uh, mistakes, or fraud, which is a deliberate attempt to basically enrich yourself in some way. Uh, the problems uh, will be uh, within uh, this that uh, financially you can be hurt uh, because fraud very often involves uh, stealing assets, stealing cash. It can give rise to misrepresentation. And so fraud can always be in two levels. It could be rather petty level stealing cash or it could be at management level where they say, I want to boost the profits because if I boost the profits, a share price goes up and a share price goes up. Uh, then I'm going to uh, get a nice big bonus or I want the share price up so if somebody buys the company uh, at an inflated price. So there's two, two kind of levels of fraud there, just uh, uh, misappropriation of assets and misrepresentation of the true financial position of the company. And of course, what we're going to have potentially coming from this is incorrect decisions. Uh, we think we have a lot of cash in the bank and there's actually remarkably little in the bank. Uh, for example, we think that uh, sales to a particular customer are going very well, but actually it's fraudulent dispatches to that customer which are going very well. Uh, and then there's reputation. If a fraud uh, becomes publicly known, then it is a kind of negative vote of confidence in that company. This is uh, why very often companies for relatively small frauds uh, prefer to really cover it up uh, because they uh, are embarrassed by the uh, the fraud which has occurred and, and the implication that the internal control system is poor and maybe management isn't on the ball. What you need uh, for fraud to happen is motive, opportunity and attitude. So motive uh, is... Uh, Somebody maybe just needs the money. You know, they have to pay their rent or the mortgage at the end of the month. They have no money, uh, and so they steal money to pay that. It could be just greed. Uh, it could be that you've had a big argument with the company uh, and you want to get your own back. That, that could be a motive uh, as well. It could be envy. Then you need opportunity. And the sort of thing that gives rise to opportunity are poor internal controls. People will simply not notice that money is missing. Uh, another example of opportunity is very complex transactions. Uh, very complex transactions, it's difficult for people to spot that there's going to be fraud going on there. Uh, it also depends on the nature of the business. So if it's a very cash-based business, then there's obviously an opportunity to steal cash. If it's a, a high value inventory type business like a jewelry shop, then there's obviously the opportunity to sell, to, to, to steal these high value items. Those opportunities can of course be reduced by proper internal control systems safeguarding those assets. 
Now, we've probably been in a situation where a little bit of extra money would help, maybe to pay for a holiday or to uh, you know, pay for a trip home or to, to, to pay off our credit card. So we've all probably experienced motive. We've all probably experienced uh, opportunity uh, to steal, for example. Uh, but I hope that very few of us have actually done it because what stops us is our attitude, that we are honest people uh, and the last line, if you like, we have to cross is, is a, a kind of moral or ethical line, uh, which, which uh, in some way maybe always tries to self-justify it, uh, or, or it is just somebody who is um, inherently a bit dishonest. So there's three elements need to be present. Detecting and preventing fraud. We've talked about control systems. Good control systems will make fraud very difficult. Or if it does happen and money does go missing, we'll, we'll, we'll spot it. Ethics, uh, uh, um, emphasizing the ethical standards that are expected of staff. Uh, uh, particularly top management mustn't be seen to be acting in an unethical fashion because if you like the you know, fish rot from the head down. Uh, and if top management is seen to be cutting corners and a bit unethical with regards to uh, perhaps the use of petty cash and so on, uh, this can rub off and staff lower down. And finally, training. Maybe training people to spot fraud, training people about the damage that can be done uh, uh, if, if fraud is taking place. Money laundering. Money laundering is a process where you take basically dirty money, which is money from criminal activities, uh, perhaps drugs, uh, people smuggling, uh, and uh, we want to convert that into money which appears to be clean uh, and which you can then enjoy without any danger. And there are three stages of money laundering. Uh, first of all, placement into a legitimate business. We, we have, what do we have to do uh, is to try to uh, explain the source of that wealth. So it might be drug money, but obviously you can't say it's drug money, but you need to say, well, it was earned from this business. And the, the sort of businesses that have been used for this uh, are businesses like casinos. Uh, our businesses like taxi firms, our businesses like even like laundrettes. Uh, now, uh, a common thing with these businesses is that they are all cash based. Uh, and if you are in a taxi firm, let's say the daily takings are really a thousand, you say actually the daily takings were two thousand. You slip in an extra thousand of the dirty money. You'll be taxed on that, uh, but in many ways that's a cheap price to pay for later on being able to spend that money without any fear. Then what you do, uh, because uh, you know, somebody might spot that you're slipping in the extra thousand a day to your taxi business, uh, and then the authorities might come after you to try and get that money, you want to uh, make the, the trail of money very obscure. So what you do is you would maybe take money out of your taxi business and begin to pass it through a whole lot of bank accounts, in and out and in and out, ideally some of them abroad in foreign jurisdictions and then back and so on, uh, really making it very difficult to track where the money has gone or ultimately track back to see where that money has come from. Because if you can't track back and say the money has come from crime, then the authorities will find it difficult to seize it. And after this kind of long, convoluted journey through various bank accounts and so on, we need to get it back in, in some way. And integration, it's almost like placement again at the end here. We have to find some way of remitting this money back to us. So maybe what we can do is to arrange you know, a, a sale of a villa abroad or, or, or say that the money is because of the sale of a villa abroad or something of that uh, type, sale of shares in the business. Uh, it has to come back and end up on our bank account with an apparent legitimate source. Behind that legitimate source, people are going to lose track of it. And even if they did follow it, it has been then placed into a legitimate business activity. 
in the UK, most company, most countries are, are, are cracking down on money laundering. It, 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 it attracts a lot of kind of big crime figures and so on. It's not, it's not great. It, it masks a lot of suffering, really. Uh, in the UK, there are three criminal activities. One is laundering itself, taking place in, taking part in the placement and so on. One is failure to uh, uh, support even a suspicion of money laundering to the authorities. In the UK, it's a national crime agency. So you don't have to have proof. You, 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 you could be auditing a company and this money comes in and you think that's an awful lot of money to be coming from a, uh, a cafe. Uh, and then uh, you, you can just say, well, you know, the, the owner sticks in some extra money to the till from time to time. There, there's a suspicion of money laundering, uh, and you have to report that to the authorities. In a firm of accountants, just to warn you, in a firm of accountants, the firm of accountants would appoint a money laundering reporting officer, and you, as an employee of that firm of accountants, would take your concerns to that money laundering reporting officer uh, who's really respons responsible then for reporting it or for saying, uh, you know, thank you for reporting it, but I've looked at this, I think it's trivial or it's explained in some other way. In, you know, it is not evidence of money laundering that, that you thought it was. And then there is tipping off. Uh, tipping off uh, would be if you're, let's say, auditing a company, you're suspicious about money laundering and you go to the uh, finance director and say, I can't see where this money has come from. Uh, my suspicions are it's money laundering. I am therefore going to report this to the National Crime Agency. And of course, if it was money laundering, as soon as you say that, the finance director will be heading towards the, you know, the shredding machine uh, to get rid of as much incriminating documentation as possible. So you, you're not allowed to let on, if you like, that you have these suspicions. Risks are particularly uh, seen where it's a cash-based business. Cash is very difficult to track. Where there are many uh, uh, deposits and similar size transfers or withdrawals for no particular logical purpose, just kind of in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, or lots of bank accounts. First of all, why do you have lots of bank accounts and why are you making all these transfers between them? It's, it's not normal to be doing that. If there are many jurisdictions involved, many countries involved, again, this can be used to obscure the, the, the trail. And it's a secrecy. If you ask, you know, about where does his money come from, and you're not given what appears to be a straight answer, uh, then you'd be very suspicious that money laundering is actually occurring.